Today we're going to talk about how to bottle your brew. We always practice our intros and decide we get we have this little battle of war here of who's going to do the intro and and I just totally did something different than I said. Brian I was gonna had do. this energetic in your face and then he's all calm and collective when we go to to uh, yeah. film and I'm just like, like to keep her on her toes. This is going to be all about how to bottle your brew. Now, this assumes a few things. First, this is for stilled beverages, not carbonated. If you want a carbonated beverage, that's a whole different way of bottling, and we actually have videos on that too. This also assumes that your brew is done. And what he means by that is that you need to make sure through gravity readings and record keeping that your fermentation has completely stopped. Yes. And don't add anything after you've confirmed that because right. then problems could arise. So typically what we suggest is you take two gravity readings one week apart and as long as those numbers are the same both times, everything is done in your vessel so you are ready to bottle. Also, you want to make sure that your beverage is as clear as you want it to be. Yeah. So that means uh, we tend to suggest dual racking, so racking it twice. That way um, you give it a second time to let everything settle out and the racket again from that. And we are actually going to rack it to a pitcher a third time yeah. <laughs> because this particular beverage we oak aged and there was a little bit of little fallout bit of from that process. So we're gonna rack it again just so we can have a more clear beverage in the bottle. The reason why we suggest going through all these steps is because, particularly if you're going to give this as a gift, it's so much nicer to give a crystal clear, no stuff falling on the bottom beverage than... Or you can hold the bottom and go, <laughs> hey, drink this, just don't look too hard at the bottom. Yeah, you, yeah. Don't, you don't want to have the caveat of, oh, don't worry about that stuff on the bottom, it's normal. Yeah. I mean, it's Which not it is. harmful. It's completely normal, but... but also, something else about bottling, you will get a little bit of sediment in a bottle over long periods of time because that is tannins and proteins and things like that that are constantly evolving as a beverage ages, falling out of suspension. It's going to happen. The idea is to minimize as much as possible. Yeah. Um, back to it being finished again. She said something that's really, really important. This is done. This beverage is finished. Do not add anything to it. And what we mean by that is if it's four and a half bottles. Don't fill that last half bottle with water too. First, you're gonna dilute it. It's not gonna taste anything close. And there's probably still dormant yeast within this brew. Believe it or not, yeast don't die at the end of fermentation, they go dormant. So if this was diluted to below the tolerance of the yeast and there was still some sugars in it, which I know there is, this is a sweet mead, it could start fermenting again and well, it'll blow up your bottles because it just will. There's just going to be way too much carbonation in there. It's going to explode. I'm not even exaggerating. It's a dangerous thing. So do everything you can to prevent that. Now, one way you can prevent it, even if you did add, is by pasteurization, which we did a video on that as well. You want to do that once you've bottled, but that's a whole other story. That's a whole different video. For now, bottling. What you need to bottle is a finished brew. The pitcher is an optional step. We're going to do it today, but it's optional. You want an auto siphon, which consists of the tube and a racking cane with a little valve at the end there and some tubing. And then on the end of that, you're going to want a bottling wand. Now, because we're going to rack first, I'm going to put the bottling wand down for a moment. <laughs> and most importantly, you're going to want some bottles. Yes. Because it's really hard to bottle without a bottle. Generally speaking, a one gallon, which is about what we have here, will make five bottles, 750 milliliter bottles, by the way. Don't ask me why the US uses gallons for fermenters and milliliters for bottles, but it does. By the way, one US gallon is 3.785 liters for those curious. But anyway, we are going to rack this first. We have a video on that. so We're just gonna go through it. And through the magic of television, we're done racking. As you can see, there is very little bit of wispy stuff left in the bottom of this. And the you reason being anyway. is that Brian was very, very careful to get as much out of this as possible because it's so good. Yeah, I like this one. It's really good. French oak. It's just an amazing thing. But anyway, now we're going to get to the actual bottling. So if you wanted to skip the pitcher step, you totally can. And let's pretend for a minute that this is your fermenter, okay? By the way, we have about 100 and, 109 
ounces of fluid here, which is like 3.4 liters. Okay, so we probably won't get five bottles, but we're gonna, we're gonna see how this goes. What you wanna do in order to properly bottle is you need some sort of elevation. Paint cans work wonderfully for this, to a point. Here's the problem. It's not quite high enough. So we're gonna have to elevate our paint can just a little bit because I want this to go to about here. In order for it to work properly, your source has to be higher than your destination. And because we're cultured people, we're gonna be using art through the ages. Books, they have more purposes. <laughs> and they don't even need batteries. I'm gonna be careful if you're using a book so that you don't spill things on it, you know, that sort of thing. But yeah, they work just fine. So what we wanna do now is get the auto siphon and get that prepped. And first thing I wanna do is remove the cap from the end because I can go all the way to the bottom of this pitcher. That was part of why I did the pre-racking to the pitcher so that I just don't even have to worry about it. And we wanna add our bottling wand. Now a bottling wand is literally just a long tube with a stem valve on the end. Sometimes they don't have springs in them. I prefer the ones with springs. For a long time I dealt without it and those aren't really all that reliable. And you just put it on the end of the tubing. I'd just stick it in like maybe half an inch or so, enough that it's not too hard to get back off later, but it doesn't pop off while you're bottling because that's bad. Don't really ask me why I know that, but it, yeah, it happens. And I'm gonna have Derek hold this for just a moment while I put the pitcher up here. Now, I have to be really careful because we have a microphone literally right there at the end of my finger. And I don't want to hit that because you guys will hear this like loud noise. <laughs> so, you know, I just have to be more careful. Anyway, so what we're going to do is we're going to put it into bottles. Now, today, bottles. We have two different types today. We have the swing top bottles, which came from Aldi. They came with free lemonade. And those are great because swing tops will actually release a little bit of pressure over time if they need to, like if it got too much pressure. But these were also pressurized when we got them. So if you did want to use a carbonated beverage, you can use these, but they also work for stilled beverages. We also have the plastic screw top wine bottles from Northern Brewer. Yep, these, I really like these bottles. They're just very simple, classic style, but they also have a little bit of a seal inside. So they do actually hold the freshness of it in. They don't allow oxygen in, but these are not made for pressure. So if you're doing anything carbonated, not the bottle for you, you want a different bottle for that. People ask all the time, which will last longer? Both, there's really no difference. You can put corks, swing tops, screw caps, as long as it's a quality bottle with a good seal, it doesn't really matter. I don't like to use metal caps for wines and things like that. I know they do it commercially, but they also have plastic seals and things like that and liners to them. The metal ones that I've seen don't really have that and I just don't trust it. So stick to plastic caps or swing tops or corks, whatever you like. Now to do this, this end with the no cap goes in here and I just drop it all the way to the bottom for the moment. And this end goes in here. Now in the beginning, it's difficult to do this one person, but it can be done. Um, I might even try to show, let me show you. <laughs> let me show you how to do it one person. I think you can see, yeah. So here's how you do it. You put one hand here and I hold this down. Notice I have to push the uh, stem valve down. Now over here is my siphon. You can't really can't see, that. see that. You can sort of see my hand. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull it up a little bit and then push down. And I'm just using my fingers to do that and see, I can get it started. It's not super, con So once it's going, you just hold it down and it'll fill. Now, I'm gonna show you all the way to the end here, but I'm gonna have to be careful because as I move this around, that pitcher could move and flop and I don't want it to fall. But what I'm gonna do is this. I'll just hold this in. And I generally go till it gets right up to about there in the bottle. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have Derek hold the bottle for me and I'll balance this. You also want to have the next bottle ready. That helps a lot. So see, we're getting close. We're getting close. It's still going. Almost there. Almost. Almost. And pull it out just like that. Hit the microphone as I do. <laughs> Hitting the microphone is an optional step. You might not. You might want to skip that for yourself at home. And then this one is now ready to be capped. 
Now notice how it's not really flowing yet. That's because we're not pushing yep. down on that stem But valve. a little bit of weight in here does actually push it down slightly. So it will flow over time. But if I push it down, see how much faster it goes? And we've just adopted a system of two person doing this just by doing this for so long together. It's a lot easier with two people. But when I did it by myself, what I would do is put one bottle like between my thighs and hold that in place. That way I could balance this, but this would be on the table rather than on a paint can or something like that. People do it all different ways. The trick is you want it to be elevated. That's it. As long as it's higher than where you're going to, it will work. Usually once I start getting pretty low in the pitcher, I will do this. I'll just tip the pitcher up. This is where it gets a little bit precarious. You want to make sure that you have a solid hold on that pitcher because it'll slide around, you know? And the reason I do that is because it puts a little bit more pressure onto the liquid in the pitcher. So it, it flows a little bit faster when you get down towards the bottom. At least I believe that's what it does. It just makes it go faster. I don't really know why. If you get really daring, you can just lift it up. Now even more height goes a lot faster. And I'll do that until it gets closer to the top or my arm gets tired, whichever comes first. So when I get really close to the bottom there, can you hold the bottom of this bottle? Yeah, sure. When I get close to the bottom there, I want to put it back down so it goes slower. And then when I get to about there, lift it out. And I know there's not much left, but for the sake of the video, I'm just going to put it into this bottle anyway. We actually have a test coming up video that we're going to do today. So it's kind of good that we only have a little bit. We get to use that for the test. And at the end, the hose will always have a little bit of liquid in it. So you want to just kind of finagle it around until it all flows out. And usually there's a little bit left in the tube itself here. So I just push that against the side and let all that get out. If there's any left in the bottom of your pitcher, you have the option to drink it, like I'm going to, like this. Yum. Or you can try pouring it in the bottle. Now, because this is such a small amount in the bottle, you want to refrigerate that. You don't want to leave this sitting on a shelf. We are going to use it right away, so not really a problem. So that is the basics of how to bottle your brew. Really, really simple, very straightforward. The real secret is making sure it's finished and degassed. We actually didn't mention degassing earlier. Degassing is when you remove the CO2 from it, so it's actually not carbonated anymore. A lot of people seem to think that, oh, if I want it to be have bubbles, that I should bottle it when it's carbonated like that. No, you want those bubbles to come out. They usually contain kind of nasty tasting gases and things like that. You want to actually carbonate in the bottle or use some sort of a keg system or something like that where you can pressure carb. Now, another thing about degassing is time will degas things as well. So yeah. you don't have to physically degas, do a technique of degassing. Right unless your brew is relatively young and hasn't had enough time to degas on its own. This one's been sitting in conditioning phase for months, so yeah. it's totally degassed. We knew this already. But like she said, you don't actually have to do the physical degassing. You just want to make sure that it has been degassed in some way or another. The final note on bottling is it's a good idea to label them in some sort of fashion. Because if you do a lot of these brews and you just have random bottles, you might not know what you're getting, which, which might could be, be fun. You know, your friends might appreciate that. You but uh, what we do is the cheater style of label, which is just some masking, masking tape. tape that we put on the the date that it was bought. The name, the date. Um, usually I do the, the date that it was made and the date that it was bo um, bottled. Right. And then we'll put the ABV. And on one bottle, I always put the final gravity just because people always want to know that when we do the one year and whatever tastings. But beyond that, it's pretty simple stuff. You can get as fancy as you want. You oh, yeah. can do the wax seals and you can have your labels printed up and all that. Most of the time, our meads don't last long enough for me to really do that. So I don't I don't get too crazy about that kind of thing. But anyway, if you enjoyed this video, look up there. There's another one. You might like that one, too. And you see these people over here? That's our VIP club. If you want to be a VIP and have your name up there, there's a link in the description of this video where you can sign up. Thanks for watching.